Uh, today, I want you to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter five. If you got a Bible, go there. We are continuing a collection of talks out of the book of Mark. We have committed ourselves to studying this one gospel for six months. We started back in January. Here we are in March. We're still in it. We're marching right now towards Easter, but we're also marching towards June when we wrap up all of this gospel. But we started a new collection out of the gospel of Mark just a couple of weeks ago entitled Small Faith. Everyone say, I, I am proud, proud to have, have small, faith. small faith. Put that in the chat. I'm proud to have small faith. Now, I want you to have great faith. I want you to have big faith. I want you to have, you know, awesome radical faith. But before you get to any of those places, why not just start out with some small faith? Because the truth is, Jesus himself said it's faith the size of a mustard seed that can move a mountain. And what we're discovering as we look at these stories in the Gospel of Mark is that it's not about the quality of your faith. It's about the object of your faith. What is your faith attached to? It's like the power of an anchor, right? I don't care how beautiful your anchor is. I don't care how polished it is. I don't care what kind of graphics you put on your anchor. The reality of it is an anchor, unless it's attached to a rock, serves no purpose. Your faith can be beautiful and your faith can be big, but unless your faith is attached to the rock of all ages, come on, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, his name is Jesus. He is the object of my faith. And we've been talking about the fact that it's not about faith and faith. You know, a lot of people have faith and faith. You know, I'm just, I'm a, uh, I'm a person of faith. Being a person of faith doesn't really mean anything unless your faith is attached, unless it's anchored, unless it's got an object named Jesus. It's never been about the size of your faith. It's always been about the size of your God that matters. So I bring you a good encouragement today. If you're watching or you're just tuning into church, maybe someone got you to tune in today. Maybe you go, I don't, I don't have this great faith or this epic faith or this awesome faith. That's okay. Jesus said, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed. It's just a little bit of faith because it's that little that gets attached to a big God that does awesome things. Now I want to read about 20, can, can you handle 20 verses today? Mark chapter five, verse 21. I want to read about 21 verses. I want to set the stage a little bit as we open up God's word. We're looking at different stories, faith stories uh, on our way towards Easter. And this might be, this is just one of those classic church Bible stories. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. Whoever you are today, I'm believing that God's going to speak something fresh and something new to you. This is the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Mark chapter five, verse 21, it says this. It says, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, someone say the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And Jesus went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Someone say 12 years. It's important that you note how long she had this issue, how long she had this problem. This wasn't a one-day problem. This wasn't a 2020 problem. This was a 12-year problem for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately, Mark loves that word, and everyone say immediately. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith, has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. I want to let everybody know who's watching right now that your faith is powerful, that your faith 
makes a difference, that your faith has power attached, that you can see signs and wonders, you can see breakthrough, you can see healing through faith. And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come me, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. For she was 12 years of age. Someone say 12. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And Jesus strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. That's about 20 verses that took about six to seven minutes, but I think God's word is powerful. I think God's word is stable in a world that is shaky. And I wanted to make sure that we took time to honor the word of God today, because I wanna preach to you from these 20 or so verses from the subject, just reach. Just reach. I just, I asked Dota to sing that song, Reach, and it just, it's in my spirit today that I want to encourage some people who are watching by way of YouTube or on the Zoom or watching this at a later time that you simply just need to reach, that there's power in your reach. I moved to Miami in 1998. I grew up in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, Most of you who are part of our community know uh, my story. My dad was an evangelist for 20 some odd years and in 1998 felt called to lead a little local church in North Miami called Trinity Church. We made the massive move all the way to uh, Miami and I I talk about it all the time, but nothing could have prepared me for the shock, the culture shock (laughs) of moving from Tacoma, Washington all the way to Miami, Florida. I've been here now for most of my life and I'm still getting used to Miami. Miami is not another city. Miami is another country, yo. It is, a, it is full of all sorts of different people, the topography, the climate. And I remember my, my first year, I moved here my freshman year, and I went out for the football team. And I'm just telling you what, like, it's, it's totally different playing football in Tacoma, Washington versus playing football in Miami, Florida. For instance, you walk outside. I don't know about you, but like, I walk outside. I'm like, I have asthma. Like... <laughs> Like I start hyperventilating. That's how hot I immediately was. I was just like covered in sweat. I, I couldn't run at all. I mean, like I was panting before I made it even out to the practice field. I remember that year, my freshman year, I was on the, the JV team. Shout out JV, 7-0, not a big deal. But um, I remember we had this coach and I, I was playing defense. I, I originally had wanted to be a wide receiver, but they said, Rich, you just, you don't got it. And it's tough when someone says you don't got it, but whatever. Uh, if God be for me, who can be against me? Um, they put me on, on the defensive side of the football. And I found myself that freshman year playing the free safety position. And, you know, all, all season long, I, I, I was playing back there. And really the moment that I'd always been waiting for was that I, I wanted to intercept a ball. And uh, just game after game, it just, it just, you know, the Lord wouldn't have it, that, that something would come in my vicinity. But I always remember in practice, there was a coach and he used to always say the same phrase over and over again. He would say, if you can touch it, you can catch it. And, and over and over again, he would just say this over and over again. Listen, listen, if you can touch it, you, you can catch it. And, and the principle that he was trying to teach us is that if that ball can get to your fingertips, it means it is close enough and it's accessible enough for you to obtain it and for you to have it, that if you could touch that ball, you can catch it. He was trying to teach us, don't give up, that if it's that close to being to your fingertips, it's just a little bit closer, it can be in your arms. And all season went by and I never had my opportunity, but finally it was the last game. Someone say the last game. Oh, I love the Lord because he loves dramatic endings. And it was there in the fourth quarter and we were down by one touchdown. But I'm telling you what, somebody threw a shallow short pass and there Rich was, the hero of the day. I'm running, I'm running and the football is right there. It tips on my fingertips and somehow I just tip it. I can hear my coach say, if you could touch it, you can catch it. I tip it up, I grab the ball, I run 40 yards until I'm knocked out 
out of bounds. Your boy had an interception. I don't want to toot my own horn, but it's true. <laughs> truth is I got hit so hard. <laughs> that thank God they hit me so hard that I fumbled the ball, but at least it went out of bounds. And so nobody got mad at me. Everybody celebrated me as a, as a great hero that day. If you could touch it, you can catch it. If, it, if, it if, it's, if it's that close, I can obtain it. If it's that close, it becomes accessible. I want you to know today that when it comes to your faith life, everything that God has for you is within your reach, but you actually have to reach out. You actually have to touch it. You actually have to recognize the things that God has for you. They are accessible. Your freedom is accessible. Hope is accessible. Joy is accessible. Health is accessible. If you could touch it, you, you, you can catch it. And, I love the story that we had today in front of us out of Mark chapter five, because in so many ways, it, it, it shows us this principle. It, it fleshes out for us what it is that I want to try to teach you today. Uh, the story kicks off that Jesus gets out of a boat. He'd come over to the other side. He's with his disciples like we see, so often see in Mark. And when he gets there, there's this great crowd that's, that's waiting for him. And when he gets there, the scripture says that the ruler of the synagogue um, really, he's like the president of the temple. He's a lay leader, and his name is Jairus. Now, anytime that the Bible mentions somebody's name, it's very important because that name gives them an identity. That name means that they are somebody or someone. Jairus, the ruler of the temple, or just maybe a better language for all of us, the president of the committee, Typically, this person like this would be affluent. They would be uh, wealthy or influential, educated. This was a very well-known man in society. Jairus, the ruler of the temple. He, he comes to Jesus in this crowd. And when he comes to Jesus, he falls at Jesus' feet and begs Jesus because he has a problem. The problem that Jairus has is that he has a 12-year-old daughter at home who has grown so sick that she might die. And this man, Jairus, comes to Jesus and says, please, can you, can you come and heal my daughter? I, I need you to come and check on my daughter. And I, I just want you to understand today that there will come problems in your life that influence, affluence, wealth, education, fame, that they cannot cure for you. There's going to come problems in your life that only Jesus can solve. Maybe you're up against something today and I just want you to know that you can live your whole life and you can accomplish a whole lot, but there will still be problems that all of your accolades, all of your accomplishments that they can't solve, that they can't turn around. Sometimes we have problems that are meant for Jesus. And this man comes to Jesus and he's like, listen, I, I need you to come with me. And I love Jesus. The scripture says that he, he goes with the man. Now, it is important that we just stop and recognize he doesn't go with the man because he's somebody. Jesus is never moved by your accomplishments. He, he's not moved by what your status is. We, we live in a world right now that just so has like a pecking order and creates status and creates titles for people. Jesus is not moved by that. And maybe the flip side, we also have a, a world that we, we don't maybe just glorify someone for their status. We, we demonize people because of their status. Jesus neither glorifies nor demonizes people based upon their merit. Rather, Jesus is moved by faith. And when this man comes with his faith saying, I believe that you can do something for my daughter, it moves Jesus into action. He needs Jesus' power. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the most powerful man in the world is not the President of the United States of America. It is not, um, the most powerful man in the world is not Bill Gates. Um, most powerful man, I don't know, um, it's not LeBron James, not, not Jeff Bezos, contrary, it's not Jeff Bezos. Um, we all know who the most powerful people in the world are. It's Comcast Cable Company, amen? Um, <laughs> Has anyone had this experience before where um, for years and years I lived in an, an apartment building and I would go to get my, my, my internet or my cable, but the building, I don't know how this is legal. Someone's got to check on this. They only had one provider for you. It had to be Comcast. You're like, okay. So you, you call up Comcast, right? You're like, hey, Comcast, um, can you come and put the cable <laughs> in my apartment? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll do it. We'll do it uh, on Thursday. Okay, cool. Thursday. What time? Uh, anywhere from eight to five. Whoa, hold on. Eight, you mean like eight, eight to five, like the whole, yeah, the whole day. You mean like you want me to skip work so I can get cable in my apartment? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what you got to do. You're like, okay. So you take a full day off of work. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. You take a full day off of work only to sit in your apartment all day long with no cable. That's a crazy sight for some of y'all out there. 
all day long in your one bedroom apartment waiting for the cable guy to come only to get a call that they're not gonna come that day, they're gonna come the next day. How is this legal? You just had me take off work and you didn't even show up and now I gotta wait another day for you to come. This is what I call real power. You say, Rich, why is it real power? Well, real power is any time that you have to wait because you have no other option. You wanna know if someone or something has power, someone or something has power when you are forced to wait because there is no other option. Let me just tell you, some of you out there today, you've got a problem that is so big, you have an issue that is so large that doctors can't cure it, Economists can't solve it. Your boss can't get rid of it. Your spouse can't fix it. No, it is a problem that only Jesus can solve. Why? Because it's only Jesus who has the power to turn things around. But you have to wait on him. I don't know what it is, but we so often fail to realize this principle that the process is a part of the strengthening. So many times we go, God, I'm waiting on you, but I feel like I'm getting weaker in the waiting. But if you understood the principle of the process, you would understand that the waiting isn't making you weaker. The waiting is strengthening you. You see, if God gave you everything that you wanted when you wanted it, you wouldn't learn anything about him. But instead, when we begin to wait on God, it begins to build our faith. We begin to establish trust in Him that those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Just because doctors said it can't be turned around, just because the bills say they're too big, I don't care what report you've gotten in the past, just because it looks impossible to man doesn't mean it's impossible for God. This is a problem for Jesus, but you gotta wait on him. You gotta wait on him. Don't stop reaching, don't quit now. If you can touch it, you can catch it. If you can touch it, you can catch it. And so he comes to Jesus, Jesus, you gotta do something right now. You're the only one who can heal my little girl. And Jesus says, all right, let, let's go and check out your little girl. And they, they start heading towards Jairus's house. Jairus, the man of status. Jairus, the man of title. Jairus, the man who's accomplished. Jairus, who has accolades. Jairus, who is somebody. Start heading towards this little girl's house. And as they're on the way, someone say on the way. As they're on the way, something peculiar takes place. This crowd surrounds Jesus. And as you look at the text, it's very, very descriptive and clear that this was a chaotic crowd, that this was a crowd that was pressing at Jesus, coming from all corners, coming and containing him. But somewhere in the crowd, a woman, we don't get her name. We get Jairus' name. But a woman comes and she touches Jesus. Now, before she gets to Jesus, the scripture doesn't give us her name, but instead the scripture gives us her issue. Her issue is, is that for 12 years, someone said 12 years, 12 years. she has been hemorrhaging. She has, has this blood condition that she cannot stop bleeding. And as you, you read the text, it says that she's been to doctors, but the doctors couldn't help her. She has gone and looked for a cure, but there is no cure. It's, it's been 12 years of her going through this pain, 12 years of the same old problem. Wow. How many know, it's one thing to have a problem for a week. Yeah. Right. It's one thing to have a problem even for a year. But man, it's another thing when you have this continual chronic yeah. issue. It's amazing me that the text doesn't even give us her, her name. Instead, all we get is her issue. I mean, it's one thing to have a problem. It's another thing when you start to identify with your problem. And there's people watching right now. It's one thing that you've got some problems. It's another thing when you start to say those problems are who you are, that you identify with those things. I am depressed. I am sick. I am full of fear. This woman is all alone. She's got issues. She's got problems. Many of us that are watching right now today, what happens to us is that we get so fixated on our problems that all we ever do is promote our problems. Listen to me, whatever you promote, you begin to personify. And many of us, all we do all day long is just promote all the things that we're going through. 
meaning that you praise your problems. You praise your fears. It's all you think about. It's all you talk about. It's all you pray about. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just focus on my problems. I want to actually get my eyes on something bigger. It's not my worry that I want to be fixated on. It's his word that I want to cling to. I don't want to personify with this stuff. Just because you've gone through it doesn't mean that you are it. Some of you right now, you're listening to me and someone is telling you that you should just give into that temptation, that you should just give into that problem, that there's no way that you're ever gonna overcome it, that this has been 10 years or 12 years or 15 years or 20 years or your entire life. But just because it's been your entire life up until this point doesn't mean that it has to be the rest of your life going forward. All you gotta do is get a touch from Jesus. This woman, she's all alone. She's been bleeding for 12 years. We don't know her identity. She's not Jairus. She doesn't have all these accolades. She's just a woman with the issue of blood. Yet somehow she makes her way through this crowd and she touches the hem of Jesus' garment. She went to Jesus in faith. She went to Jesus believing that if she touched him, she could be made well. But just think about this issue. All alone. It's amazing how problems, when we begin to deal with them on our own, they, um, they lead to isolation. And isolation has a tendency to intensify your pain. Whereas community, it has the possibility to cure your pain. But many times it's, it's the pain or the problem that just isolates us. This woman, because she'd been bleeding for 12 years, we can just begin to assume many different things about it, that she, she probably was never married because uh, it was impossible for a man to marry someone like that because she was considered unclean during that time. Uh, Because she was never married, being a woman in that day without a husband meant that she probably had no financial gain, that she had missed out on so many financial uh, benefits. Because she's not married and doesn't have a husband, she also probably doesn't have any kids, meaning she doesn't have a legacy. In a Middle Eastern culture 2,000 years ago, it removes your legacy, which is everything you're living for. This woman is all alone in her pain. But something about this woman I don't know if I can call it great faith. I think I got to call it small faith. One day she hears the reports that Jesus is passing through. How many know that Jesus is passing through right now today? He's just passing through. He's just passing through. It's like a pass that goes up in the air. The pass is just coming through. He's just passing through right now all over the internet. He's just passing through on this Sunday. And this woman gets it in her mind. She has this boldness inside of her that if I can just touch Jesus, then my whole life can be made different. If I can just touch Jesus, this 12-year problem can turn around and I can find the healing that I've always dreamed of. This is a bold move to reach out. I just want you to get it. It's a bold move to reach out. I mean, sociologically, it's a bold move. She's a woman. I know we have a lot of girls in the house today. Thank God Voo Church is made up of powerful, epic, awesome women leaders. Can I get a shout out from all the girls today? But 2,000 years ago, just being a girl meant that you were, you were, over the, you were an outcast in so many ways, that you were put to the side. You were discarded. I mean, you can go to Luke chapter seven when a woman walks into where Jesus is. There she is with an alabaster box. Everybody at the table accuses her, mocks her, and makes fun of her because she was simply a woman. But this woman's like, yo, I'm not gonna let my gender stop me from getting into relationship with Jesus. But it's not just a sociological problem. It's a theological problem. (laughs) I just want you to see this. That theologically, she had a problem in front of her. The problem was is that she's bleeding. And because she's bleeding, you can't touch anything. Because if you touch anything, that thing that you touch makes them unclean. But as we've seen from Jesus over and over again in, in Mark's gospel, that he's not afraid of touching the unclean areas of our life. That Jesus came to bring life to the things that are dead. But here's this woman. Her religion is preventing her from getting close but the hope of relationship is pushing her towards him. I I wonder today who's watching right now and religion would say, you don't belong at church. Religion would say, you don't belong acting like you're a Christian. Religion would say that your issue and your problem is your identity. You ought to just get clean and then come to Jesus. Jesus would say the opposite. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever's hurting you, whatever's challenging you, if you'll just reach out to me today, I can make you well. 
Yo, this woman is weak in flesh, but she's strong in spirit. She says, I just got to get to him. If I can touch him, I got to feel that I can catch whatever he's got. This is a picture of faith. I don't know how to describe to you faith in any better way than this story right here because so many of us, we think faith is this big grand thing that happens from a stage. No, faith happens oftentimes when you're crawling on your hands and knees saying, I'm just trying to get close to my savior. It's amazing, a lot of people in church today just kind of behave like this. Well, if the Lord wills it, he'll make it happen. Really? I think it's a little bit more than just the Lord's will. I think your will matters also. It's not just the Lord's will. We know that the Lord is willing and is able. The question is, are you willing to reach out? Are you willing to draw close unto him? I think many times people just don't reach. P people don't reach. I remember um, a couple of years ago when we were moving to Miami, we were living in Fort Lauderdale for many years serving at Trinity Church. And when we got ready to move to Miami, I, I called some of my buddies up. How many know good friends are the ones that show up to move you? Yeah, these guys, they, they showed up to help me move out of my apartment and they had gotten there earlier that day and they called me and they said, yo, Pastor Rich, we're trying to get into the house. I said, I left the back patio door unlocked. They said, yeah, we're here, um, it's locked. I said, are you sure? They're like, yeah, it, it's locked. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna be home in about 20 minutes and I'll, I'll open it for you. I'll never forget, I, I got home and I, and I went into the front door and when I got to the front door, they were, there's two guys sitting out on the back sliding door and they're just sitting there. And I walked up to the door and I looked right when I got to the door, it was unlocked. Wow. And I looked at them, I said, they're like, yeah. They just, you know, when you're in motion, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, and I went, I took two hands, I went, and I kind of put a little, you know, put a little, put a little effort into it, and the door slid right open. Wow. I said, fellas, what was that all about? They said, oh, we, we tried it once, and it wouldn't open. I said, hold on. I told you the door was unlocked. You, you tried it once and then you called me to let me know the door was still locked and then you proceeded for 25 to 30 minutes to sit outside in the hot sun when you could have been inside all because you believed after one shot that the door was locked? Yo, there's some people right now that you're going, yo, I would approach Jesus. I just think the door is locked. Listen, you can't say the door is locked if you've never even turned the knob. You can't say the door is locked if you haven't tried more than one time. I got a feeling today that if you would just put a little bit more effort into it, you would recognize the door is not locked. The door is open. Oh, come on, somebody give him praise today. The door is open. You just got to put a little bit of effort. You just got to reach a little bit more. This woman is proof positive that in your weakest moment, you are still strong enough to get to Jesus. I feel like I'm so weak, Rich. I feel like I don't have anything left. I'm telling you what, you don't have to have great faith. You just need small faith. Small faith is that I won't quit moving towards Jesus. I won't quit going towards Jesus. I won't quit reaching. And this woman, she just keeps on moving towards Jesus. And as she gets towards Jesus, the scripture says that she touches the hem of his garment. And the moment she touches the hem of garment, this was crazy. The moment she touches the hem of his garment, everyone say immediately. Immediately, a 12-year problem she was healed from, she, she sensed the healing go through her body. This gets me excited today. This is powerful today because she didn't even touch Jesus. She just touched the thing that was touching Jesus. Like I could understand if this was Jesus and I touched Jesus, you know, God in the flesh full of divinity that if I touch him, that his power would go in me and change me. But that's not what happened. She just touched the thing that was touching Jesus. This is what I love about church and people miss this about church. Church is powerful because some of you, you invite people into God's house and as they come into God's house, listen, they might not touch Jesus, but they might touch you. And because they've touched you, you've touched him. Before you know it, healing, breakthrough, restoration can take place. I've been with him, I've touched him. The same power that conquered death, hell and the grave, it's living inside of you. The scripture says that as she touched the hem of his garment, 
The scripture says that Jesus, he, he turned towards the woman. I mean, she came up on his backside. She came up behind Jesus. And all she gets to is just barely touch the hem of his garment. But as she touches the hem of his garment, the scripture says that Jesus, he immediately feels power leave his body. In fact, the Greek word there is the word dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. I want you to know that, that the power that's inside of Jesus, it's greater than any dynamite stick you could imagine, that it's explosive power. And the scripture says that when she touches him, Jesus senses power leave him, as if to say, it's just another picture of the gospel, that he is emptied of his power and he is made weak so that you and I might be made strong. This is what he does over and over again. He gives himself that we might find life and life more abundantly in Jesus. He stops and says, who touched me? It's amazing because what you'll see over and over again is that Jesus will try to teach principles and try to give points, but then the disciples will try to like rebuke him. But you're just so stupid. You know, it's just like, if, if anything we can learn, just be silent, you know, just Jesus is talking, shut up, you know? And they're like, oh, Jesus, come on. There's all sorts of people around you. Everybody's touching you. There is no way that you could actually pinpoint one individual person. But Jesus is like, actually, I can. Because the reach of faith is different from the reach of fame. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I didn't come on and turn on the YouTube because it's popular. I don't go to church because it's a trend. I don't show up and lift my hands and worship week in and week out because everybody else is doing it. I don't come to Jesus because he's famous. No, I come to Jesus and I reach out to him, not because of his fame. I reach out to him because of faith, that I believe that in him I can find restoration. In him I can find life. In him I can find healing. In him I can obtain all that I've been looking for. And what a powerful picture, right? Because Jesus is walking away from this woman and this woman comes and stops Jesus. I just want to let everybody know today that Jesus can't be interrupted. Some of you are like, I, I'm not going to bring him my stuff because he's got busier and better things to do. And if you're thinking about it from a doctor's standpoint, he does. A little girl is dying and an old woman who has a chronic problem is saying, don't forget about me. And most times we would think, wait a minute, Jesus, you should deal with the little girl first and then you should deal with the old woman with the chronic problem. Don't interrupt Jesus. He's got better things and bigger things to do. But Jesus is saying, no, if you call out to me, if you reach out to me, there is no problem too big and there is no problem too small. I care about them all. From the famous to the nameless. You got a chronic problem, you got an acute problem, you bring it to Jesus. You can't interrupt him. You can't interrupt him. I don't know if I should actually be real about my struggle. I don't know if I should actually get honest about what I'm going through. He's probably got something bigger to deal with. Not true. Jesus is saying, no, I got time for you. But the scripture says that he, he turns towards the woman. I want you to see this. When he turns towards the woman, this woman with the issue of the blood, she's down on her hands and knees and she looks up into the face of Jesus. And when she does, she is afraid. You say, why would she be afraid? Well, can you imagine looking into the face of God? According to religion, according to the Old Covenant, according to the Old Testament, there was no way, you had no ability, you had no ability to look at the face of God. In fact, remember that story in Exodus where Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments? He says, I wanna, I wanna see your glory, God. God says, hide yourself in the cleft of the rock, and when I pass by, I will show you my backside. This woman would have known about the old covenant. She would have known about the glory of God, but now here she is with all of her weakness, with all of her struggle, with all of her pain, with all of her problems, and there she is, and she's touching the hem of the garment of God, and he turns and looks at her eye to eye, face to face, and we are seeing the glory of God right there in the flesh. It reminds me of what Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter one, it says it in such a beautiful way. It says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many 
times and in various ways, but in these last days, which is right now, 2021, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son, AKA Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The old way said you can maybe get a glimpse of his backside, but the new way out of relationship says, stare right into my eyes. I don't just want to give you a miracle. I want to identify you and I want to put a relationship on your life that says you are mine. See, this woman, she's bold despite what the sociological limitations would say and despite what her theological ramifications would be she'd say I just the hope of relationship that's all I want that's all I'm looking for and so she pushes past it faith begins where your ability ends you understand this right like I didn't wake up this morning and say God dress me God put my outfit on me if you do that you're really really spooky and you're a really creepy Christian because you don't need to pray things that God has already given you the ability to do. No, faith. Faith is being sure of what I hope for. Faith is being certain of what my my senses and my eyesight cannot see. Faith begins right where all of my ability ends. Faith begins right at that moment where I'm saying, you know what, Uh, I believe the Lord wills it, but I think he's now waiting on me to reach out. I think he's waiting on me to try the door again. I think he's waiting on me to knock a little longer. I think he's waiting on me to wait a little while longer. My ability has ended, so now I'm stepping into faith. I don't know how this is gonna go, but I will come up on his backside, and I'm hoping that if I touch him, Just a touch from him could change me forever. I love Jesus because he turns and looks at this woman. You got to see this. He's not satisfied with just giving you a miracle. That's not why he came. He didn't come to get rid of your back pain. He didn't come just to give you a bigger bank account. He didn't come so you could have a better house and healthy children. All of those things are good, but he came for something deeper why he stops and says who touched me they said no no everyone's touched." He said no I left I, I felt the touch the reach of faith and this woman terrified she she says it's me and what does Jesus do Jesus looks at the woman what does he say he says daughter Whew. he says daughter your faith your faith has made you well your small faith your little faith, you're, you're crawling, your fear, you're trembling, you're coming up on the back, just, the, the, trying the slider two more times, three more times, w- the waiting, the linger, your faith has made you well. So go in peace and be healed of your disease. Notice this, he's not satisfied with just healing you. He wants to stop. He wants to confront you. He wants to look you in the eyes. He wants to establish a relationship with you. You are not your issue, but rather you have the greatest identity the world could ever know about. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. Woman, you're a daughter of God. You're not your issue. You're not your setback. You're not your problem. You're not your hurt. You're not your hang up. He calls you daughter. He said, Rich, why does he do it? He does it because even if you don't have a father named Jairus, even if you don't have a dad who's got accolades and a dad who's got education and a dad who's got money, even when you don't have a dad who will pray for you, even when you don't have a father who will stand in the gap for you, oh baby, you got a big brother and his name is Jesus. And he'll show up. He is a father to the fatherless. He is a friend that sticks closer than any brother. When you don't have a dad to reach out for you, your brother named Jesus, he will stand in the gap for you. Daughter, your, your, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Grab a seat, I'm just talking. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. And this woman, she stands up 12 years, the same problem, immediately it was gone. I just felt so strongly in my spirit right now, people that are watching, you are not your struggle. You are not your issue. 
I don't care how long it's been. I don't care if it's been your whole entire life. It doesn't have to be your entire life moving forward. He's within your reach. If you can touch it, you can catch it. Catch what, Rich? Catch the revelation that he wants a relationship with you. He's passing through. Catch the belief that he loves you more than you love yourself. Catch the fact that you have an identity, that you are a child of God. You can catch today. Well, how can I touch him? How can I catch him? You can do so because he has positioned himself in your way. He's positioned himself to be touched. He's positioned himself to be reached. He's, he's accessible to you. This woman, you can imagine just how incredible this day is. Woo, that was awesome. I'm healed, I'm well. But in the middle of this celebration, all of a sudden a report comes from Jairus' home. You remember Jairus, right? The father who came and asked Jesus to come to his house. What a picture, right? You've got a pressing need. Jesus, we gotta go right now. My daughter, I can't even imagine. It's just too hard to describe to those of you that don't have children. Like, I didn't know what love was until I held my baby boy. Take everything from me, man. I just, but don't touch that boy. I can only imagine this man coming to Jesus. I mean, he's a Jewish leader. He's coming to Jesus. It's already kind of telling you this is odd that he's going to this carpenter from Galilee. He must be pretty desperate. It's Jesus, please come with me. My daughter is sick. And Jesus is like, yeah. And so they start walking and then a woman with no name, we don't get to hear her title. She must have been nobody back then. She stops the entire crowd. And I bet Jairus the whole time is going, this is not going good for me. This is great that you're doing that, but I got this thing over there. We got to get going. Can we leave? We got to go now. My daughter is sick. And then the worst thing thinkable happened. While he was waiting on Jesus, the report came that your daughter has died. And the man you can imagine begins to go, it's too late. We waited too long. You were too busy with other things and you missed out on the most important thing. I love Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says, hey, um, she's gonna be all right. Let, let, let's go to your house. Let's, let's get on the way. And this man's like, okay. No, I just found out she's dead. We needed to get there before she died. He's like, no, 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 Let, let's head over to the house. And the scripture says they get over to the house and when they get to the house, everybody outside the house is crying and they're wailing that this 12 year old little girl has died. Isn't it interesting? I don't think any of this is by mistake or by coincidence. We got one girl who's 12 years young, then we got one who's 12 years sick. We got one who's been 12 years of growing, one who's 12 years of declining, one who's died suddenly, and the other who's been dying slowly, both desperate and in need of Jesus. Jesus gets there and everyone's crying and everyone's making a big scene. And when Jesus walks in, he says, yo, quit crying. This is the savage side of Jesus. Imagine showing up to a funeral, stop crying. This is bold, this is confidence. Quit crying. She's not dead, she's merely asleep. The scripture says they begin to laugh at Jesus. What I love about Jesus is he gives us a powerful principle. What does he do? He removes them from the room. Yeah. Just wanna encourage some people this year. Some of you, the only way your healing is ever gonna happen is when you clear some people out of the room of your life. It's about time that doubt leaves the building. You need criticism to exit the premises. You don't need any more sarcasm. You don't need any more fear. You don't need any more worry in the rooms of your life. You gotta get all the negativity out before the breakthrough can happen. The scripture says he clears the room. He grabs the mother and father by the hand. And the scripture says he reaches down to the little girl. And as he reaches down to the little girl, he says, wake up. And the little girl, 12 years of age, comes back to life. Oh, I don't know if you saw it, but it's powerful. The old woman, her reach, it healed her. But Jesus' reach, it resurrected her. One touched Jesus, the other was touched by Jesus. One got a healing 
but one got brand new life. I want you to understand that as you reach out to him, when he touches you, whew, it's a picture of salvation because that which is dead comes back to life because he doesn't just do resurrection. No, better than that, in the Gospel of John, he says, I am resurrection in life, meaning whatever my hand touches, it resurrects. It comes back to life. Your reach is powerful. Oh, but my reach is so much greater. <laughs> I was in Colorado just a couple of weeks ago and I was snowboarding for the day. And uh, all throughout the day, uh, I had my, my phone in my pocket because my son was back in the room and I was checking on him with my mom who was watching him. And I got on one chairlift and my, my, my coat pocket was open and my phone fell out of my pocket. And right when the chairlift went, I was like, I feel like I, I lost my phone and I'm looking around for it. I'm like, you gotta, you gotta be kidding me. I go, my phone fell out of my pocket. It's lost, it, it's gone. So I got to the top of the mountain and then I snowboarded all the way down. I got to the bottom of the chairlift and I'm trying to find my phone. I'm trying to look for my phone. I, I get the chairlift operator. I'm like, I think I left my phone. He's looking around for 20 minutes. We can't find a phone anywhere. Well, all of a sudden as I'm standing in this vicinity, my iPhone watch, my Apple watch, it starts going off with all these text messages. And I go, I go call my phone, call my phone. And when, when they call my phone, my, my Apple watch is, is ringing too. I'm going, oh wow, this is, it's gotta be around here because it's connected now. And so now I've got the whole entire place. I'm like trying to go, all right, we gotta find this watch. We gotta find this phone, we gotta find this phone. And I said, I, I can't find it. They said, well, have you pinged it? I said, I don't know what that even means. What does that mean? You gotta ping it. And someone came over and they opened up my watch and there's this little button that says ping. And so when you hit this button, it makes your phone wherever it is go ding, 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 ding. And so for 20 minutes, I'm just walking around and I'm just pinging it. I'm just ding, ding. I can't hear nothing. We're out in the snow. Ding, ding. This is like ridiculous. And I'm like, can we stop the chairlift, sir? They say, no, I'm so sorry. We can't stop the chairlift. I said, but my phone. They're like, your phone is not our priority. This is a mountain. I'm going, okay, ding, ding. 25, 35, 45 minutes. I'm out there dinging and pinging and dinging and pinging. Would you believe it? Somebody falls off the chairlift. She doesn't make it on. She, she kind of, and have to stop the chairlift. And so she's okay, she's fine, are you okay? Now she's okay. I'm hitting ping, I'm hitting ping, I'm hitting ping. <laughs> you okay? You, you, you give her some more time, give her some more time. Are you okay? Make sure she, you know what? Make sure she's okay. Ping, ping, ping. Before you know it, about 20 yards away from me, the guy in the goes, there's something ringing over here. There's something ringing over here. I go, sir. The chairlift guy go, it's over there. And the guy runs over to the chair. I I'm not making this up. This man starts digging down into the snow. We're talking two feet into the snow. I'm going, bing, 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 come on, bing, bing, bing. I'm talking about four minutes of digging. This man, I I've never seen, this is a miracle, y'all. This man, two feet of snow, reaches out and has my phone in his hand. I've never seen something like that in my life. Sometimes in life, all you can do is ping God. Sometimes in life, all you can do is keep on praying. Sometimes all you can do is keep on waiting. Sometimes something looks like a disaster. She fell off, are you okay? And then it detours into something else that gets a little bit closer, but you just, you keep pinging. It's what the psalmist said, he says, he reached down from on high and took hold of me and drew me out of the deep waters. He says in chapter 40 or verse two, after the pinging kept going, that he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. How many of you know, my phone was completely not capable of getting itself out of that snow. All the phone could do is ping another time and ping another time, but every ping was a reach. And as it kept reaching, there was a greater reach taking place. Oh friends, your reach, well, it's a call, but his reach, it's a rescue. Your reach, it's only a prayer, but his reach is always an answer. Your reach is a praise, but his reach is a breakthrough. Your reach is a touch. His reach is a restoration. Your reach is repentance. Oh, my baby, his reach is salvation and salvation to all those who reach out. Somebody say, just reach. Just reach today. If you touch it, you can catch it. If you touch it, you can catch it. It's just within your reach. Her reach 
it healed her but his reach little girl get up and she was resurrected from death back to life you got another ping in you just you got another ping I know life might feel like it's buried you today you might feel deep under that stuff the pressure might be growing the pain might be unbearable I didn't come to you preaching about great faith and strong faith and epic faith. I came preaching about small faith because if you have a little, God can do a lot. Sometimes it's just pressing through the crowd. Sometimes just getting close enough to touch him because when you touch him, everything you, he has, you can catch it today. Every bit of freedom, every bit of health, every bit of breakthrough. Come on, is there any worshipers in the house today? Is there anybody who came in this place today believing that as you ping heaven, he's gonna reach on down and he's gonna pull you up. Come on, lift your hands today. Come on, lift your voice.